thrill to have uh, Senator Roger Wicker here with us, our own senator and his guest, and I'll let him introduce those. But before we start, if you have questions that you've written down, pass them to the center aisle. We'll pick them up. Okay? Senator, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, and, th and thank you all for taking the time. Uh, we're going to try to make this an hour and, and uh, have sh short answers to uh, important questions. But let me say a word or two uh, of, um, of introduction here. Uh, I, I don't think there's a more important issue for our time, uh, for, for the next term or for the next several terms, than the, the issue of health care reform. Uh, we know that there are things that need to be addressed in our system. Uh, uh, Health care needs to be made more affordable, more accessible, more portable, uh, and we need to uh, target our health care resource, resources at the actual problems. Um, <coughs> by the same token, um, Americans are beginning to get more and more alarmed about the bills that they see coming out of Washington, D.C., and as I've gone around Mississippi, during this August break, uh, I, I can see that, that more and more information is coming down. And, and there is bipartisanship on this issue. And basically, it's in, in the form of, uh, of doubts and alarm over what these sort of uh, proposals would amount to. Uh, I saw a poll the other day, and, and uh, some 32% were in favor of what they saw coming out of Washington. 49% were opposed, with the others undecided. But uh, of those opposed, uh, we asked, the, the poll asked, why are you opposed? And 14% and, uh, said they thought it would, it would harm the quality of health care in our country. 11% uh, said they simply do not trust the federal government to run something as big as one-sixth of our gross domestic product. And then uh, some 10% said they felt that it would be too costly and would drive up the debt. Those, those are real concerns. And they're the types of concerns that, that I've heard, uh, not only before this August break, but particularly during this time when the attention of our nation is focused on this. So I think it's very, very appropriate that we gather here today in one of our great medical facilities, uh, Baptist DeSoto, uh, with, uh, with some longstanding friends of ours from Mississippi and the Mid-South, and welcome uh, two people who really know where they speak when it uh, comes to public policy and when it comes to health care. Uh, we have Dr. Tom Coburn on, on my left and uh, Dr. John Barrasso in the middle. These are the only two United States senators who are also physicians. And uh, they come today as part of what, what we've come to call the doctor show. Uh, this is their uh, third uh, visit outside of their states, and we very, appreci very much appreciate them including uh, Mississippi and, and uh, the Memphis area in their stop. Tom Coburn it specializes in family medicine and obstetrics. He has personally delivered more than 4,000 babies. Uh, in 1995, uh, Tom and I were freshmen together in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, he then, uh, after several terms, he retired from the House and a Senate seat came open, and, and he ran for that and was elected some six years ago. Uh, he is an influential member of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Help Committee, which has jurisdiction over health care legislation. Now, uh, John Barrasso uh, was a freshman with me in the United States Senate. Like, uh, like I was, he was appointed to fill a vacancy and then was elected in his own right last November. Dr. Barrasso has been an orthopedic surgeon in Casper, Wyoming for 20 years. He has served as president of the Wyoming Medical Society before joining the Senate in 2007. Uh, he, uh, he also serves on the Energy, Environment, Indian Affairs, and Foreign Relations Committee with me. We are delighted to have these two here. I'm going to call on uh, John Barrasso to say a word or two. Uh, of introduction, and then we're going to jump, and, and then and then he'll turn it over to Tom, and we will jump right into questions and field um, questions that uh, that reflect your concerns. So, John. Well, thank you very much, Roger. I want to thank all of you for being here. I practiced orthopedic surgery in, in Wyoming for 25 years, was chief of staff of a hospital of 125 uh, doctors, and uh, my wife's a breast cancer survivor. She's been through three operations and two rounds of chemotherapy, so I've seen it from, from both sides. And, and now I'm in the United States Senate. 
Uh, in Wyoming, I was the medical director of something called the Wyoming Health Fair, where we do about 60 to 70,000 blood tests a year for people that they can find out if they're uh, hyperthyroid, if they have uh, problems with diabetes. We started doing this when we didn't even know there was a difference between good cholesterol and bad cholesterol 25 years ago, but all in the idea of giving people information they could use to stay healthy and keep down the cost of their care, which is so much of preventive medicine is, um, is about. And now that I find myself in the United States Senate uh, looking at all of these issues of, of health care, been traveling around Wyoming, talking to people, and great concerns about that they think it's going to cost them more if some of these bills get passed, and the care they're going to get is going to be worse, and people everywhere want to get more value for their money, not less. They, people ask, what's in it for me? Uh, and, and we all know as practicing physicians that, that this is a health care system that needs changes. There are things that we need to do much better, much differently, but I'm not convinced that, that these bills back here, and we'll pull them out in a couple seconds, uh, have all the answers. So. Uh, but uh, what Tom and I have been doing is something called the, the, the Senate Doctor, the television show twice a week on the Internet. This is now being broadcast live over the Internet uh, to people all around the country. We get thousands of email questions coming in, and we try to answer them in a way that's not just the, the eight-second soundbite that you hear on the nightly news, uh, just so we can – and hopefully that's what we're going to be able to do today for an hour or so – answer your questions in a fuller way and make sure that you really know what's in the bills. and want to hear back from you also what you think is important, uh, because we know there are better ways to do it than what we see being proposed in Washington, or at least being debated uh, right now in the House and in the Senate. Tom? Well, thank you, Roger, for inviting us. I'm pleased to be here with you. Uh, uh, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. Uh, I had metastatic colon cancer six years ago. Uh, the wonders of American medical treatment and research uh, is the reason I'm sitting here with you today. Um, We've got a lot of problems in healthcare, uh, but we ought to use what we were trained in medical school to solve them, rather than to use what is politically expedient to solve them. And uh, I, I've always remembered the three tenets that I try to practice in Washington that I used in medicine: is listen to the patient, and they'll tell you what's wrong with them. If you really listen, they'll eventually tell you what's wrong. Number two, if it's been done, don't do it again. And number three, don't do any harm. And and there are aspects of our healthcare system that nobody can compete with anywhere in the world. If you've got cancer, this is the country to have it in. If you've got heart disease, this is the country to have it in. If you have acute injury, this is the country to have it in. But our costs are twice what everybody else's are. And we know that one out of three dollars that we spend on healthcare in our country doesn't help anybody get well and doesn't prevent anybody from getting sick. So we ought to go after that one third of the dollars that aren't being spent efficiently. And for example, uh, defensive medicine, which is $200 billion a year, uh, which we're, we, I, I readily admit, I've been sued as a practicing physician. You can't deliver 4,000 babies and not get sued. But the fact is, is it changes practice patterns. And not, not for the good, but to the detriment of us as a society and our patients. Uh, so we have cost shifting tremendously from the underpayment of Medicare and Medicaid, which comes to another $200 billion a year. So you got 16% of the cost of health care that we, we could readily fix tomorrow. And then we don't incentivize prevention, and we don't incentivize, we don't pay you for management of chronic disease to, to where you can actually get paid for it. You, 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 we run the Medicare uh, uh, Ferris wheel, and then every other insurance company copies off of that, and so we end up finding ourselves doing what gets reimbursed rather than doing what we know we were trained to do. So lots of changes that way that we can, that we can make. Uh, the question I asked, I've, I've, I did town hall meetings all over Oklahoma. We averaged 900 people per town hall meeting. I mean, people are genuinely concerned, and, and rightly so. But we do need to make significant changes. But we don't need to do it at the federal level. We need to incentivize it so it can be done at the state level. And, and we need to have a dialogue with the American people where we're really listening of what their concerns are, and then we design a bill that actually addresses the problems in health care but doesn't put it in the control of the federal government. There is no federal government program in health care. It now counts for 61% of all the dollars spent in health care that is both efficient and effective. And when you consider 20% of all Medicare dollars paid out are fraud, we don't know what Medicaid is. We know it's somewhat above 15%, but nobody knows for sure. Uh, we know that uh, Native American health care is a joke in terms of the commitment versus what we spend. And we know that our military personnel are not getting the treatment that they want to get and should be getting for the sacrifice that they're making, making for us. So 
why would we have more government run health care when, when in fact it's not highly successful in the way it's doing now? And that's not to say Medicare doesn't solve a lot of problems and create access. But when 20% of Medicare dollars aren't going to help anybody, something's wrong with the system. Well, we have a number of questions, and I'll, I'll call on you. Larry Black has the first question. I think if we take Larry's question, we could probably spend the rest of the afternoon on it. Where's Larry? Hey, Larry, you want to stand up and ask? You had asked about the bills. You had asked about a number of different things. Here's a microphone. First of all, uh, I really want to know if you guys have read and fully digested the 1,000 pages. Yes, I have read it. I can I, after I hear you talk, I believe you. Well, you talk about the th – now, the 1,000-page bill or the 1,018-page bill is the House bill. And none of us are going to have a chance to, to vote on that. And it's actually in three different committees, and they have different amendments on it. So this is now kind of divided up. Then you have the Senate bill from the HELP committee that Tom is on, and he has not only read every page, and I'm not on this committee. I offered 187 amendments, uh, only one of which was accepted. Uh, you would have liked all 187 amendments, that, uh, but some people didn't. This is the, the, the unbound – this is the loose pages of the HELP committee bill. But this has not been bound together because they didn't want this to be out there for people to see over this August break. Uh, this was the bill originally authored by Senator Kennedy's staff. We lost Senator Kennedy, and it's a, it's a loss to the institution, and it's a, it's a loss of half a century of a, of a family of great tradition uh, for our country. Uh, but this was the bill that his staff has put together and has been debated. That, so uh, you know, our thoughts and prayers, I'm sure, of everyone in this room are with it. Kennedy family. Now, John, also, but when we left for the break, this bill it does, still doesn't have a number because it hasn't been fully published, and therefore CBO, Congressional Budget, has not been able to score it. Is that correct? Well, we have the score on it. We, we, this is $1.4 trillion over seven years, rising at $240 billion the last year of it on an increase of about 8 to 11 percent per year which will raise the cost of your state's Medicaid probably about $300 million a year at a minimum growing at a compounded 8% 8, 8 per year. And, and they used uh, accounting tricks to get it down to that number because they're going to be collecting tax dollars for nine years but only providing services for the last six years with that. So the numbers really get high and really get expensive when you start 10 years out. And if, you know, when you look at the amount of spending going on in the country, the amount of debt that we're looking at as a nation, the amount of government takeovers, you know, the people, at least in my state, and what we've been talking to, are not interested in this, uh, this answer. The, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Thacker, the hospitalist who was nice enough to take us on a bit of a tour today, has a couple of questions. Uh, you wanted to ask about uh, hospitalists and uh, how we would convince maybe our children to consider going to medical school. Yes, the first question was the hospitalist system has been proven to improve quality, decrease the length of a stay, and uh, minimize nosocomial complications, but it does come with a price to the hospital. Is there any provision in the reform to increase reimbursement to the hospitals who uses hospitalist system, or at least the patients who are taken care of by the hospitalist system? Is the reimbursement going to be uh, better or higher? And, and hospitalists helped a lot at our hospital when we brought them in, but it almost yeah, seems the from the Duke no. experience it's the, the other the, way around. The answer is no. I mean, that's a, here's a common sense thing. How do, how do we decrease readmissions? How do we shorten the length of stay? Uh, how, how do we accomplish things that we know are cost effective? None of that's in this bill. You know, it, there, there's not much common sense here. There's, there's 88 new government programs requiring 150,000 new federal employees. But there's not much to incentivize the things to change what's wrong in medicine and, or uh, give a reward for what's right. Well, the Duke program, I mean, they, they yeah. tried to do what was right. <clears throat> Most they of got the, penalized for the it. The cardiologists in the room will recognize the Duke, Duke high-risk uh, uh, class 4, class 5 heart failure patient uh, prevention program where they cut hospital admissions by 29% but had to shut it down. They saved Medicare about $100 million in hospital admissions, but they wouldn't pay the cost of doing the clinic. So the net the net savings to the Medicare was $70 million, bucks, but they, they wouldn't pay for it, so therefore there's no pre-outside clinic in North Carolina now to prevent hospital readmission for unstable heart patients. And the second question was, how would you convince a child growing in this area to go into medical school and go for primary care when out of high school he can go for plumbing or heating and air services and probably make $80 an hour, whereas if you really 
uh, translate the hours put in by primary care and the salary they get, it comes out around $55 an hour. That's MGMA reimbursement. So how do you convince a child growing in this area to go into medical school to really answer the question of shortage, of physician shortage? Well, I'll, I'll try to answer it. You're going to get doctors where you pay them. You're going to get doctors where you pay them. And what is, why, why did we have one in 50 doctors who graduated this year from medical school go into primary care? Because the incentive to go into primary care isn't there. How did we get there? Who sets the payment levels for all everything in this country? Medicare. And then the insurance tees off of that. There is a percentage above it. So we are, we're going to have fewer and fewer and fewer primary care in this country because because we won't pay for the value of that investment and that kind of loan value, uh, the debt that you have when you come out of medical school. Why, why would you go when there's a 350% payment differential to spend another year and a half in residency and get paid at a whole different level? But, but I think in addition to that, I'm concerned about people in this room just retiring if this goes through and becomes law and they try to decide that they're going to reimburse, you know, everybody at, a, say, a Medicare rate. And, you know, so much of our practice had to do with, the, the payer mix of the different patients because we took care of everyone. You know, I do four knee scopes on a, on a given day, and, you know, you get four different amounts of money, and somebody you maybe not got anything from, somebody else who had full insurance, you got an amount that was higher than if everybody was paying that rate. And it's, it's how it all balanced out. But if they're trying to, in a way, you know, tighten that down to everyone at Medicare rates, the hospital can't afford to stay open. No hospital can afford to stay open. In spite of the wonderful efficiencies that we saw here and the flow charts and all the things that are being done well, you can't run this place at Medicare rates alone. None of us, none of us can do it that way. So, uh, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, the president talked about some of these unnecessary, he called what, too many people take up tonsils because it's too much or they do an amputation. And then I went on Fox News and said, doctors go into medicine for the right reason, to take care of patients. It's because it's something that we believe in. It's something we want to do. It's, it's, uh, it, it is a love and a passion that drives us. I gave the commencement speech at Georgetown, my alma mater, this year. Uh, and talked about going into medicine for all the right reasons. Take care of not the disease, but the person with the disease. That's why we're in medicine. Uh, so uh, I would hope that young people would continue to be sought to seek careers in medicine because they know what you've done. They know the impact that you've had on their lives. They remember when they were a kid going to the pediatrician and said, I want to be like that when I grow up. But for the, the financial incentives are not going to be the reasons that I think drove any of us to medicine. But I would hope that young people would go through it. I'm concerned about those of us in this room retiring from medicine and the demands for the patients are going to be harder to find physicians to take care of uh, under this kind of a proposal. See, uh, Mike Foster had a question. Uh, Mike, are you here? Mike, uh, you were asking about COBRA and EMTALA. And um, yeah, I look at COBRA and EMTALA as a federally mandated program that there's no reimbursement. The, the hospitals and the doctors, it's all on our backs. We we have about a third of the patients that come to our emergency room with no insurance as emergencies, as surgeons. We have to take care of them. Uh, the hospital has to take care of them. They come from all over North Mississippi here. Is there more of that to come in this bill? Well, the goal, the, 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 that's not the goal, but that may be the unintended consequence. The, the biggest worry about 1,000 or 1,600 pages worth of legislation is, is the unintended consequences. Uh, look, you, you know, you've only heard one side of the story. There, there are six other bills out there that eliminate pre-existing illness, that actually give insurance to those people who don't have it today, uh, create the opportunity for them to get it. Uh, they have to participate some. There has to be some personal responsibility and accountability that doesn't raise taxes on anybody, that actually cuts health care costs and improves physician reimbursement. I mean, you know, with the amount of money that's out there, we can do that if you just kind of do some of the smart things. Um, so I can't tell you what all the unintended consequences are, but I can tell you everything the government's touched in health care so far has made it more complicated, more expensive, with, with a greater effort on our part, and whether it's nurses or doctors or aides or whoever it is, to get the outcomes that we want to see for our patients. They've made it more difficult. And what we ought to be about is incentivize making it easier and, and quit spending money on things that don't have any impact on health care. Uh, but yet we, we do. If you look probably at the administration of this hospital, 
the number of people that are working in this hospital to take care of paperwork that the government demands or has indirectly demanded it through the insurance industry, if you just didn't have to do that tomorrow, all of a sudden the margins in this hospital would be tremendously increased, which would give us the ability to care for people. You know, I'll make one other point. In this country, we're still caring for folks, just like you just said whether they have insurance or not. The problem is is cost is our access limit, limit. And what we have to do is work on the cost. And then we have to, what we do in our bill is we make equal the tax benefit for everybody. Right now, if you're buying your own health insurance, whether and your employer isn't, it's costing, you lose $2,700 worth of tax benefit versus somebody who is with an employer who's buying it for them. So you get $2,700, but if, you, if your employer doesn't do it, you're getting cheated out of the tax code of $2,600 because you only get 100 bucks. Why don't we treat everybody the same? Let's give everybody the same incentives. And w what we know is if we do that and if we create personal accountability and responsibility and we, we incentivize the right thing, the American people are not stupid. The, the assumption from Washington is, is you don't know how to make decisions for yourself, therefore we must make them for you. And, and it doesn't really fit with what the Constitution says, and the assumption is quite elitist and arrogant. Sure. I've taken a poll of most of the doctors that I know. A simple thing that could have been done years ago that would have made all of us a lot more available and a lot less uh, tired of being uh, indentured servants to the government, if they would just allow us to write off on our taxes at a Medicare rate the care we give to indigent patients and give us a, a tort reform, we would all sign up to and, and the cost would go down. And they would not even have to pass a single cost yeah. bill You're right. in the legislature. It's called common sense. Uh, there's not any of it in Washington. <laughs> well, you know, and he said, and give us tort reform. And I think on just about every question, they mentioned tort reform. And uh, you won't find that anywhere in any of these bills. Not, not, a, not a word. Now, I don't know if anybody was at the American Medical Association when the president came and spoke uh, in June. And, uh, and said, you know, we need to do something about lawsuit abuse. And, you know, he got a standing ovation. People went, and he said, no, I don't mean caps. But, uh, you know, and, and there, that's the last he's ever said about it. And, uh, but we know in Texas that uh, when they passed tort reform, you know, the, the malpractice rates went down, the amount of uh, defensive medicine went down, the, the, the tests that were ordered went down to protect ourselves. Uh, and the only thing that went up is the, num the number physician of physicians. Physician recruitment to Texas skyrocketed. So you talk about you talk, you talk about how to deal with the manpower shortage in a community, and you say you, make, you give these opportunities. And I know Mississippi has recently done some tort reform work, Roger. I don't know if you want to comment on that, but there's a, uh, it, for a long time this was the worst place in the country. Uh, in Wyoming, we tried to amend our constitution to get some tort reform, weren't able to do it. We're having significant problems. Uh, we were in Omaha yesterday for a town hall meeting, and. So on the border with Iowa. And so a physician who's delivering babies on one side of the state line where they have tort reform in, in Nebraska is 30% cheaper malpractice rates than if they're over in Iowa. It's 30% higher. Uh, so that, you know, the cost, those are costs that gets passed on to the patient, liability for the hospital, liability for the, uh, for the individual physician. But, but the liability insurance that we all pay, and I was paying $55,000 a year practicing orthopedics in the middle of Wyoming, that was small compared to the number of tests that we would do, uh, the, you know, the MRI, the CAT scan, and uh, no matter all the defensive medicine, the defensive medicine, the newest technology, which I mean, some is because patients demand it. The standard of care is now if you bumped on the head playing baseball. You don't just get the sheet. Uh, the kid doesn't get the sheet, or the mom doesn't get the sheet to say wake them at two and four in, in the morning and make sure they're okay. Every kid gets the uh, gets the, either the CAT scan or the MRI, uh, and. And with that comes the, the, the financial expense plus the radiation expense. Uh, but that is now the standard of care in America. So that has driven up the cost because of the, the defensive medicine. And yes, sir? The recent judgment in this community was $24 million against an OBGYN, uh, the woman who had a hereditarily defined form of breast cancer, for which she had a bad dream that she developed a tumor. But it was the doctor's fault. You know, how do we make that case to uh, a number of legislators who ha don't have medical degrees? They have a different uh, degree, and uh, and they don't think the way we do about this. And it's a uh, 
but but the point is there, there's not there's there's not a fragment of a sentence in, in this thousand page bill that deals with defensive medicine or medical liability reform and and frankly it's 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 not just people from the Republican side who are talking about this uh, Michael Kinsley is probably the most liberal columnist that the Washington Post uh, has ever seen and and he wrote a column, and I found myself on the floor of the Senate the other day uh, extolling the virtues of Michael Kinsley's column because he said, slow this down, uh, pick the low-hanging fruit, and, and let's talk about electronic records, let's talk about outcomes research, and let's talk about medical liability reform. And uh, so I, I, I guess I need to welcome Michael Kinsley to, uh, to the conservative caucus. But, uh, but it's, the point is, the concern about the things in this bill and things like medical liability reform, uh, which are left out, uh, is, is bipartisan and, and crosses the spectrum. Do, do you think Mississippi, if they got an extra $150 million for Medicaid a year, would pass a tort reform bill? Because that's what our bill does. We give a bonus to every state that passes tort reform. We don't tell you what to do. We just, and, and really, you shouldn't. If you look at the Constitution, the Constitution, you don't really want the federal government managing your tort laws because if we start managing your tort laws, there's nothing else left for you all to manage. So what we do in our bill is we incentivize the states to pass tort reform, and we do it by hanging a great big carrot out there. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I don't know what you all spend on Medicaid, but I guarantee it's a ton. Well, let me, let me ask this. Uh, how many folks in this room think Medicaid is a good deal? Okay, well, uh, you should know that the legislation coming out of both houses of Congress would mandate more Medicaid patients for almost all the states. And uh, our, our governor, Haley Barber, says it would bankrupt the state of Mississippi, but don't take his word for it as a conservative partisan Republican. The two-term governor of Tennessee, Phil Bredesen, called this the mother of all unfunded mandates and says it's something that Tennessee cannot accept. So again, I, I, I make the point. Uh, since Tom raised uh, the, the, mentioned the word Medicaid, I make the point that opposition to much of this bill is bipartisan and it is uh, um, of great concern. Uh, can I ask another question? What if every Medicaid patient you had had a basic federal FEHPB basic Blue Cross Blue Shield plan and had a debit card to pay the copays and deductibles? What would you think of that? How many would accept a Medicaid system like that? Well, not many, huh? Not with the Blue Cross plan. Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's the same. It's the same plan that I have. Okay? Would you rather it's have the same plan that I have? <laughs> we know we all have good insurance. Would you rather have somebody with federal insurance, or would you rather yeah. have somebody with Medicaid? Yeah. So the point is, and that's what Roger, Roger's co-sponsor on our bill. That's what we do. We empower people who need help to get the same kind of help that everybody else is getting. Rather than say, we give you a system, but by the way, you can't get into 40% of the primary care, and you can't get into 65% of the specialists, but we're going to call it health care. And this bill increases 40 million Americans to go on Medicaid. That's their answer. And of course, and, and tells the states to pay for it. Yeah. And there was a National Governors Association meeting here, right here, the Haley Barber put on, where the, both parties said, this is awful, we can't do it. The, uh, you know, you mentioned this $24 million judgment. judgment. When something like that happens, all the doctors in that field know about it across the country very rapidly. And then that becomes the standard of care. Even the, it just it, That's how we then decide, and that's why the, the costs go up. And we know that we are not perfect. None of us. We're all human. And if something happens, what we know, we, don't, we want to get the waste out of the system. Well, 60% of the money in the tort system doesn't go to the injured party. The injured party who really is deserving it takes much too long for them to get the money. And 60% of the money goes to the system itself. It goes to the expert witnesses. It goes to the lawyers on the defense, lawyers on the plaintiff side, all this. And it goes on for years. And it seems that we could save 60% of the money and take care of the injured much more quickly. Uh, but again, Washington doesn't get that right, never has. Uh, Dan Four has a question uh, from uh, South Haven. Dan, are you here? Yo, thank you. <coughs> My question is about the doctor shortage. It's already been alluded to in, a, in other comments, but 
Um, I know we hope that uh, people, uh, you know, the best and brightest will continue to go into medicine for the love of, of the patients and et cetera. But, um, you know, I think we can all agree with the, the medical legal and reimbursement climate that, um, I mean, even several Democrats agree there's going to be a doctor shortage. So what are we going to do about that going forward? Um, you know, maybe it wouldn't even affect some of the, a lot of the people in this room, but you know, for generations of the, of the public, um, you know, how are we going to handle uh, when people can't get to see a doctor for, for months and months, you know, the stories we hear about out of the U.K. and Canada? Let me tell you something. That's the design. The plan is to use physician extenders for primary care. There won't be primary care physicians in this country. That is the plan. If you look at what – I had a staff member who was in Canada went to the ER. A PA took care of him in the ER. But the PA was complaining to my staff member because her six-year-old child was way, had to wait, wait six months to get in to see a specialist in Canada. She's inside the system and couldn't rig it so she could get her kid cared for. So the point is, is you won't see it. There won't be a family practice doctor out there in 20 years because we refuse to pay for it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to downgrade all this. And I, this is not to say PAs are not valuable. And nurse sure. practitioner, I use them all the time. Sure. I, I'm thankful for them. But when, when the plan is is to eliminate, to lower the cost by eliminating the quality of service and the expertise. You know, I didn't get this gray hair just living this long. You know, 4,000 babies will give you a lot of gray hair. Uh, it also will give you a lot of experience. And, and the problem, we, we haven't even begun to talk about comparative effectiveness in this model. How many of you know the Framingham studies? They've been going on for 60 years. You know, there's still four questions we haven't gotten answered out of the Framingham studies, but yet the assumption in this health care bill is that we're going to have 16 ivory tire doctors going to make the decisions on what the best practice is for all of us on everything. And that will work on 70% of the patients. But the other 30% it won't, which it requires the art of medicine, which they've just thrown out the window and said there is no art of medicine anymore. And we all have experiences that we know when we've cared for patients that had we done the standard thing, they'd be dead. Had we, Because we had the experience and the art, we saved their life. Because not every patient with the same disease presents the same way. And so the whole idea behind this is you lower the cost by lowering the access to the system. And, 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 and just, then we ration. In the markup for this bill, three times, we offered amendments that prohibited rationing of health care. All three times it was denied. They, they voted to stay on all three times, but said we have no plans to ration health care. Well, if you don't want to put a prohibition on there, there's got to be a little crack in the door in the back that you really do want to ration care. And that's the way they think we get out of it, is if you got a 78-year-old person that has other comorbid conditions, they're not, we're not going to fix their head because that's what happens in England today. We just don't pin their hip. I mean, that's what you're, That's where this is going. And, and they can deny it all they want, but their actions bespeak their words. You know, you look at the Massachusetts study. They put a, in Massachusetts, not just a study, but in Massachusetts now, they passed the health care program a couple of years ago. They found out it's cost much, much more than they ever thought it was going to cost. Uh, and in Massachusetts, you know, there are more doctors there per capita than any other state in the country. Yet there aren't enough doctors to take care of the patients that want to see them to the point where now it's a 35 to 40 day wait to see a family physician in Massachusetts. The emergency rooms are getting overrun now. Actually, emergency rooms uh, uh, visits are up 7% in Massachusetts because under this, but those hospitals are getting less because their, their program was supposed to cover people to go to see other, uh, other physicians and they still don't have it right. Plus, it's gotten so expensive that now they take money out of education, out of police, and out of fire, and they're still running behind in Massachusetts. The same thing's happening in Maine. But and you have, you have 109,000 people who were on the system that have been booted off. Mm -hmm. and, and Massachusetts health care premiums for insurance are higher than any other state. It's been on a true trajectory much lower Massachusetts than any other state. And, uh, and Maine is actually up there, too, because they have these uh, community ratings where young people cannot get the differential uh, benefits. So a young person in, Mass in, uh, in Maine is paying $770, a healthy young person, $770 a month, whereas the neighboring state it's 220 because the, the young people are subsidizing. And this is, these health care plans are very, uh, very much uh, detrimental to any young person who is going to buy their own insurance. Uh, Dr. Brownstein has a, qu a question. It's 
the failure of uh, the systems, the National Health Service in the UK and Canada. For example, in Vancouver, they've cut medically necessary surgeries by 25%. In the UK, over 4,000 women were not able to get maternity services last year because there were no beds. They delivered babies in the halls, in the bathrooms, on the street. Uh, and they're in Oregon, they have a socialized medicine program, something like Massachusetts. A woman had breast cancer, was prescribed a chemotherapeutic by her doctor. The state denied it, but they offered to pay for her assisted suicide. So I'd like to know uh, what you think of that and uh, why isn't this being talked about? Well, I, 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 just to answer your question, uh, I've spent a lot of time on the Senate floor talking about those very specific things. Two million people a year in this country are alive who had a cancer diagnosis. Had they lived in England or Canada, would be dead. You know, the other side of this is three out of every four medical innovations and advancements come out of this country. And when they slam health care in this country, or they slam physicians like saying ENTs just take, you know, they take tonsils out to pay the mortgage rather than because a kid needs it, you know, it, 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 it denies the fact that they lack any insight into how medicine really works. Now, are there poor doctors? Sure. Are, are there guys that are wrongly, but the, by far the su super majority of people who are in health care, whether they're a physician or a nurse practitioner or a nurse or administrator, are dedicated folks trying to do a good job. We're having trouble with all the traps and the fences and hurdles we have to jump every day to try to give the care. In other words, we're having trouble in spite of what they're doing, giving it. And if they weren't there, things would probably go a little smoother. So we've, we've talked about it. The problem is, is we don't get a voice on the media because the media wants government-run health care. They want single-payer health care. So it's hard to get that message out. That's part of, part of the, the doctor show is to get a message out in the other media that doesn't go through the major networks and major news channels. Because the people that actually support this bill say, oh, that'll never happen. We won't have a Canadian system. We won't have a, a, a British system. And then uh, we go and talk on either MSNBC yeah, or And we Fox don't plan on rationing care. So that's what they say. And then we get, uh, you know, not really. Those, those are the examples that are out there. Yes. And they refuse to look at that. Yeah. And that is exactly what we're in the yeah. And you look at Calgary. and you know, They cut 2,000 uh, cataracts. Decided that you're just going to do 2,000 fewer cataracts. It was a financial decision so that you don't have to be almost blind. To, to have your cataract procedure, and that was between one year and another. It was completely a financial decision, not a medical need decision. For my, they, won't, they won't inject people with bags of steroids to have bags of cataracts. Yeah, well, and you can't get in. And they have a quarter of the number of MRIs, a quarter of the number of, of CT scans, and you, and you say, okay, is that right? Is it, what's the right ratio? What should it be? But the wait in Canada is so long, and that's why our cancer survival is much better here because of earlier detection, earlier treatment. Uh, you know, and, and I practice and in Wyoming. And availability that are not, that is not available. There. So when you have a member of parliament in Canada who came down with a tumor, uh, who was a big supporter of the Canadian health care system, but she had means, she went to California to get her health care. And, uh, you know, and, and, and people are, but, but you're right, you know, you should, how do you get this word out? We talk about it on the Senate floor, we talk about it on Senate I, I can tell you how we, we get it out, it. and it's not through the American Medical Association. All right? Here's, if we want to win the fight, medicine People in medicine have to get organized outside of the AMA, and we see millions of people every day. What we have to do as caregivers is educate the American people. That's how we can win this. And, and there are some working on this, but if you had a way to explain to every patient that came across your office or you saw in the hospital every day what, what the debate is about, what the real facts are, are they going to trust the guy on the news or are they going to trust their doctor? They're going to trust their doctor. And so what has happened, and the reason we're up behind the curve is because physicians have had their head down taking care of folks while people are starting to ruin the system that uh, uh, makes available that great care in this country. You know, and you just look at this, this specific hospital here, um, and they think these things called never events for Medicare. So we're not going to pay anything for a never event, like operating on the wrong limb. Well, that makes sense to us. That should never happen. But then they came out with a whole second list of, quote, never events. Uh, deep vein thrombophlebitis after a hip procedure. Well, I operated on a lady, had a, a, a hip problem. She was in an automobile accident, gave her Lovenox afterwards. 
She got a DVT on the side of the hip, and she bled into the other hip. I mean, there was no right dose to give her, but that's a, quote, a never event. Uh, you have done incredible work in your intensive care unit with uh, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias. You got it way down with the purple tube and all of these other I mean, it's amazing what you've done. But you take transfer patients in from other hospitals. Somebody who may have been in a car wreck had a little bit of an aspiration, and the pneumonia shows up a couple days later. You're not going to get paid. You're not going to get paid for that. You know that. Why? Because the government doesn't want to continue with its responsibility. I mean, the government is the biggest deadbeat payer in the whole system. That's the problem that we're living with every day, and that's why you get all this cost shifting. And I've gone on too long. Uh, well, well let, me, <laughs> let me interject. Let me interject on cost shifting. Is it true? Because we've heard it both ways. Does this legislation? Or does it not cut the Medicare program and take money from one entitlement program to put it in this new program? It's $500 billion over the next seven years. Is it, is it just Medicaid adva Medicare Advantage? No, it is not just Medicaid, Medicare Advantage. Just remember, uh, any gastroenterologists in the room? A radiologist? Okay. There are certain patients that are too high risk for, col for a colonoscopy. Everybody agree with that? But may have something going on. It is now illegal to order a virtual colonoscopy on a Medicare patient. It's totally non-reimbursable. It's called rationing. They have decided we won't do that. Now, was it being overutilized? Maybe. But the answer for a bureaucracy is don't change the requirements for it. Just stop it. And so that's what we've done. Is now now you can't d use that procedure on a Medicare patient, and a Medicare patient can't legally pay for it themselves. Now, part of what the, made this country great is freedom, and liberty, and the ability to make decisions for you that have, and and you also to suffer the consequences of the decisions you make. But yeah, we're moving to a stage in multiple areas as the government's taken over more and more of the industry and the, the areas of our country to where you don't get to make those decisions. Somebody's going to make them for you. And so we're starting to see the rationing of care now in Medicare. And if you think about it, Medicare only pays for five procedures associated with prevention. Only five. And they should be paying for 50. But they're not because they don't see it as cost effective when the, the number one thing we need to be doing is preventing the complications from chronic disease. Uh, Walt Carnahan had a question about uh, insurance. Yes. My main question, I mean, there's a lot of areas, and I've got notes written down, and I just couldn't cover them all. But what about, in, is there anything in this for insurance reform? I'm family practice. I also specialize in headache management. But from a family practice standpoint, uh, you know, I'm lucky to get 50 cents on a dollar from insurance companies. I cannot see a wellness visit and a problem-focused visit at the same time. So it really irritates the patients that they got to pay two copays, that I can only do wellness. And, of course, when they call the insurance company, they say, oh, yes, you can do that. But the thing is, they're not going to pay me to do that. If I see someone in the office with pneumonia, if I do a chest x-ray, if I do a breathing treatment, if I give an injection of antibiotic, I'm only going to get paid for one thing. I can't practice medicine and stay in practice. Uh, so, I mean, is there some place in there uh, that is going to yeah. address that? Yeah, yeah. Every, every Republican alternative eliminates pre-existing illness and creates the requirements for a true competitive insurance market. All right? It, we don't have health insurance in this country. What we have is prepaid medical expense for which the insurance industry ta extracts a portion of it with a certain amount of bureaucracy that says what you can and can't do. So th the only way we really ever get out of the bind, whether it's the insurance bureaucracy or the government bureaucracy, is to restore the individual to making the decisions about their health care. And, and so that's why Safeway is so successful is because the individual at Safeway today makes the decision about the first $2,000 that are going to be spent. They get to decide. I, I have friends in my hometown who no longer take insurance of any type, Medicare or Medicaid. They have a totally open practice. They can't ever go back to Medicare. They know that. And, and they say, I'm practicing better medicine than I ever did in my life. I used to have four people in my office. I have one. Uh, I hand them 
a, a bill. They can file it on their insurance, whatever their insurance pay. They like the care because I now have the time. I don't have to run the, the, the traps to see so many patients. Now I'm a better doctor doing what I was trained to do and making the same amount of money and seeing fewer patients and doing the right thing by them. Uh, we need to get back to that so we can actually use our training to take care of and truly take care of every aspect of the patient, their emotional well-being, their spiritual well-being, their physical well-being, to truly be compassionate physicians again. We have a system that's driven us away from that, that's trying to deny us to do what we were trained to do. We didn't go into this to make money. We went into it because we truly cared about seeing difference made in people's lives. And we have a system that's diminishing that. So we're not going to get any of that till we truly create a competitive market in insurance, a true competitive. And what you do is you allow people to buy across state lines. You allow people to buy the deductible they want, not what the state says you can buy. you got to have transparency with that so insurance companies don't game them. You, you, we eliminate cherry picking through what's called risk readjustment. At the end of the year, at the end of the year, if one company's got all the health patients in there, you know what they're going to be doing? They're going to be making payments to all the rest of the insurance companies. And we've seen that work in four countries in Europe. It's highly effective at eliminating cherry picking so, so that people really get insurance instead of prepaid health expense. So, yeah, there, there are mechanisms in all this to address. There's none of that in this. What they want to do and what Lewin Group, which is the world-renowned uh, actuarial on health care says that if you pass either of these bills, 114 million Americans who have their health care paid for by their employers today will lose it and they'll go into a public plan. In regard to that, but dealing more uh, Medicare, uh, the pay for, for, per, uh, pay for performance, uh, that kills me. I mean, I can't take a patient home and make them take their medicine and make them do the lifestyle modifications that I spend time in the office and documenting that I have said, look, this is the diet you need to do, this is the exercise you need to do, this is the medicine you need to do, and when their hemoglobin A1C is still not at an acceptable level, I get dinged by being a, called a bad physician because that patient's not doing it, and then, then I don't get paid. So I have... A lot of heartburn. But with, but, with but the, the the motivation's in the wrong place. The motivation ought to be on the patient that's non-compliant and the cost of the patient, rather than the doctor who can't get the patient to be compliant. Yeah, it, it, this isn't hard stuff. It, it's you, you're you're talking about Medicare. There's no common sense in Medicare. There's no reason to experience with what they're doing there. They're looking and they're saying, we got to control costs. Let's start doing it. And some bureaucrat who's never been out and treated a patient in the world said, well, let's do this. And all of a sudden, we're doing that. Uh, that's what happens. You know, re remember, bureaucracy's axiom. Never do what is best when you can do what is safe. And that, it, all, it doesn't matter where the bureaucracy is. That's how it operates, is you got to do what's safe for the bureaucracy. And so we get all these stupid rules. And there's nothing wrong with transparency in terms of outcomes. You know, I had this great perinatologist that when I had really sick patients with help syndrome and everything else, man, I shipped those ladies to, to him as fast as I could. Well, if you look at his outcomes, they're terrible compared to mine. But his outcomes are phenomenal for what he was taken care of. And yet if Medicare made a judgment on that, I'd look great and he'd look terrible. And he's the best doctor. So, you know, how we do this matters. But having the federal government decide is the wrong way to decide it. Yeah, we, do, we were testing 60, 70,000 people a year uh, with Wyoming health fairs. Medicare will not pay for any one of those blood tests. For 19 bucks, you can get you know, SMA20, you can get uh, uh, thyroid stimulating, or the whole, everything you get. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is a little more expensive. Medicare says no because it's prevention. Well, that's what I said. They yeah, won't pay they, they for won't wellness. Pay for any of that stuff. They won't pay for it. And so we have to incentivize that in any health care bill we do if we want to control the cost. Yeah, Otherwise, we're never going to control the cost. $180 billion increase in cost last year due to obesity. We have an obesity epidemic. You know, 50% of all the money we spend in this country in health care is on the 5% of the people that eat too much, exercise too little, and smoke. And they're ended up with high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, heart disease, etc. And it doesn't give you any – it doesn't even give the – this doesn't give an incentive to the person to try to lose weight. Now, there's $10 billion a year in here to draw, to build walkways, jungle gyms, and put streetlights up. So 
but that's not going to give an incentive to somebody. But we know we were in Allegiant uh, Healthcare System yesterday. We have 9,000 employees. This is in Omaha. You know, they'll pay people to quit smoking. Give them a $500 bonus if they quit smoking because that knows it's going to drive down. Cost. That's how you keep your health insurance. That they talk about the curve, and, but that's how to keep the cost curve you know, flat or decrease it. Get people to live healthier lifestyles by giving them individual incentives. You know, people, I think, are really smart when it comes to their own money, but so often it's not their money that they're spending. My busiest day of the year practicing orthopedics was usually New Year's Eve. It was the day I did, I remember they did eight operations on New Year's Eve because people would come in a little before Christmas, you know, I have this, my shoulder's been bothering me or my knee, and, uh, and they say, can you do it? Uh, after Christmas, but before the first of the year, because I want my free operation. They're very sh smart when it comes to how they spend their own money, but they don't care as much when they're spending government money. The greatest pleasure money. in the world is to spend somebody else's money. And until we reconnect the cost of health care with the purchase, we're not going to have the incentives to, to, to manage it properly. And we need, we need everybody looking at that. Look, financially, this country is tapped out. We're broke. Nobody will say that publicly. We're broke. Our foreign policy is being affected because China is our number one loaner. And so, therefore, we're afraid to offend the person who's controlling our destiny with our bonds. So now our national security is at risk. We can't afford $4 trillion over the next 16 years. So there's got to be a different answer than the government spending more money making more stupid rules that isn't going to change the outcomes and ration and care. There are better answers. What we have to do is demand that we get to work to do the better answers, and the best answer is to make those decisions as close as you can to your own communities, not in Washington, D.C., because we've already talked about the absence. There's not a thimble full of common sense in Washington, D.C. We, we, uh we know you have to get back to work. We promised we'd be done at 4.30. Roger, thanks so much for allowing well, thank me. Thank you for coming Mississippi. in. Thanks for allowing Thank you very much for all your helpful thoughts and advice. And uh, we're going to take these messages that we hear from you uh, back to Washington, try to get rid of these bills and get something much better passed. But uh, anyway, thank you for participating in this edition of Senate Doctors.